Awesome. I'm going to let people in now. Hello, everyone. As you could come into the into the room, either virtually or in person, um, with our Fashion MA students who are here um, on this camera that has Deanna Armenti's name. But um, I'd love to welcome you all to. I'm very excited to welcome you to this launch of our Volume Four of Fashion Studies. Oh, and sorry, I am Allison Matthews David. I'm one of the co-editors. Um, I am a middle-aged white woman wearing pink glasses, um, purple earrings, a gray top with um, shiny iridescent rainbow epaulettes and cape. And hi everyone, my name is Ben. I am a co-editor of Fashion Studies with Allison and we're so excited that you're here. Um, I'm a white queer man. I have black glasses on and short brown hair. I have a white button down shirt on and a leather vest with spikes, like I'm ready for a fashion battle. Um, so I'm very excited, thrilled that you're all joining us today. Uh, I know we're joined from sort of around the world, um, but I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the land that Fashion Studies, our main office is located on. Fashion Studies is on the Dish with One Spoon territory. That's a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee. And I think as we give this land acknowledgement, we really like to think about how we can make it personal and contextual so it doesn't feel like just kind of a check mark on a to-do list before an event. And I think for us at Fashion Studies, we're really committed to expanding the histories, the narratives, the practices of fashion, um, in particular ways that center Indigenous people on Turtle Island and their fashion practices, not just as the original designers on this land, but as the incredible resurgence and designers of the present and of the future. And I think of two ways we've done this. One, one of our most sort of read articles is called Indigenous Dress Theory by Shake Ottman. And I encourage folks, if you haven't read it, to please read it in volume three. We've also just launched our special issue, Fashioning Resurgence, that specifically looks at fashion on Turtle Island and includes two feature articles and a series of panel discussions. And we hope you really enjoy that issue. And so this is work that we're committed to, not just in the past, but to doing, to really centering Indigenous fashion theories, histories, and practices in our journal. Thanks, Ben. And, um... Yes, my, my rainbow warrior cape is by Leslie Hampton, a designer on Turtle Island, and Warren Stevens Scott designed the earrings that we all love so much, um, both indigenous, amazing Indigenous designers working on Turtle Island. Um, and I would like to welcome Mia Yaguchi Chow to um, give an update on Fashion Studies in Volume 4. Thank you, Allison. Yes, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Mia, the graphic design and project lead with Fashion Studies. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you all the first issue of our fourth volume on behalf of our open access academic journal. We've grown so much since volume three, not to mention volume one. And we're so thankful that you're all here to celebrate this launch with us. 
In the past year, Fashion Studies has been awarded funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Council of Canada as part of their Aid to Scholarly Journals grant. Our journal also launched our first special issue, Fashioning Resurgence, focused on Indigenous fashion on Turtle Island, with a second special issue on the state of the field launching in 2023. And of course, we are already working towards our fifth volume. And today's volume, volume four, issue one, brings you a diverse series of articles from authors Megan K. Hughes, Sandra Mathy Garcia Rada, Suzanne Rowland, Samuel Snodgrass, Elizabeth Ann Weigel, and Shamira Covington, Abdilla Foes, and Moralake Dairo. Three of these authors are with us here today to join us on our panel. And this issue proudly offers such great contributions to our field. And we're so thankful these authors have shared their work with us. Our panel today will be moderated by our co-editors and journal co-founders, Allison Matthews David, professor and graduate program director at the School of Fashion at Toronto Metropolitan University, and Ben Barry, Dean of Fashion at Parsons School of Design. Our panelists today are Mora Lakedaro, author of User-Generated Content in Fashion Media, a study of Asoebi Bella in Nigeria, Evdila Foz, author of Trans Feminine History, a History of Feminine Denormalization, and Suzanne Rowland, author of A Day in the Life of Daisy the Blouse Maker in 1916, Storytelling as a Creative Research and Teaching Methodology in Fashion History, all of which are articles you will soon get to engage with as we launch this amazing issue. Dr. Moralake Daro is an academic at the School of Media and Communication at Pan-Atlantic University in Lagos, Nigeria, who has research interests in marketing, fashion, cultural and health communication, and place branding. Evdila Foz is a master's student in fashion studies at Parsons School of Design with a focus on Black, queer, trans, art, design, and fashion practices. And last but not least, Suzanne Rowland is a lecturer in fashion and dress history in the School of Humanities and Social Science at the University of Brighton. Her doctoral thesis addressed the role of design, technology, and women's labor in the rise of wholesale blouse manufacturing in Britain from 1909 to 1919. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we're so excited for you to share your incredible perspectives with everyone. Lastly, thank you to our managing editor, Jacqueline Marcus, and editorial assistant, Deanna Armenti, for your hard work making this launch and volume happen. Uh, and now I'll let Ben and Allison take it away. Thank you again. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to use the chat. Thank you so much, Mia. And of course, a huge thank you to you for everyone that gets to engage with fashion studies and sees the beautiful design of our articles, the layout, the overall creative direction. Uh, that's all because of Mia. And so we're also so grateful to everything you do and the talent you bring to our journal. So I'm excited to get started um, and to really to begin with our first question. Um, we'd love our panelists to take a moment to introduce themselves, to start with a visual description, and then to briefly tell us about their contribution to volume four. So maybe Morlake, we can begin with you. Hi everyone. It's good evening from here in Nigeria. It's 7.30 or seven o'clock at the moment, 7.09. Um, I will describe myself. My name is Morlake Dairo. Um, I'm a female black of Nigerian descent. Um, I have dreadlocks, I'm currently wearing um, African shaped earrings and a tie and dye outfit called Adire um, in Nigeria. Um, my work is an intersection of user generated content and fashion digital platforms. Uh, and the case study looks at um, a digital platform called Bella Niger in Nigeria in a particular segment called Ashebi Bella. And so it sounds like a, a mouthful, but my my work just is a summary of how digital fashion of fashion platforms in Nigeria have kind of evolved um, due to the digital revolution. And um, pri prior to this, fashion magazines and fashion content in Nigeria was really limited to physical magazines. And so, as blogs became a thing, um, I observed that there was there was the there was a change in the way information was exchanged on digital platforms, especially for fashion. And if you look at the fashion sphere, you would 
from an editorial point of view, you will discover that there was there's a bit of a rigid um, process in who determines what how information passes, right? And my study kind of shows how things are changing from a user point of view. Now, users are contributing information, sharing pictures, and they've kind of become the content producers, the content editors, and my study kind of looks at that. So it gives a journey of how users on the Ashebi platform kind of contribute their pictures, even put out suggestions on the kind of content they want to see. So there is an evolution on how fashion content is being exchanged um, across the world. And it's also happening in Nigeria where the fashion creative industry is actually blooming and changing. So that's what my study covers. Yeah, thank you. And such a fascinating study and how you've approached it. And I'm excited that we'll get to talk a little bit more about it later on today in our panel. Thank you. Suzanne, I will throw it to you now um, for your introduction and visual description and to tell us about your contribution to this volume. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm a middle-aged white woman with shoulder-length hair. I'm wearing um, pale pink glasses and um, a military-style gray shirt. I don't know if you can see it, but it's got some kind of lingy bits on it as well. So I look like I'm going into battle with Ben. Um, my research developed, so my article is a development from my PhD research, which explored the rise of the ready-made blouse in the UK in the 1910s. I very much wanted to explore this industry from the perspective of workers on the factory floor, rather than a kind of top-down exploration that looks at um, business um, managers and entrepreneurs, because lots of histories have been written of that and less so of workers on the factory floor. Um, the problem I had was that um, research was fragmented. I mean, I would have loved to have found a diary or an oral history of um, a blouse maker or designer, but that just wasn't there. Instead, I found fractured pieces of um, research um, in different places. And um, so I created this semi fictitious story that I called Daisy the Blouse Maker, where I pulled my evidence together to um, write about a day in the life of Daisy. And she became um, a 2000 word sort of introduction to my thesis. And because I'm a, a lecturer, I um, started to use this in my teaching practice and I developed the idea of storytelling as a creative research method into um, workshops to work with students. So my uh, article kind of deals with how I created Daisy's story. It gives an example of a day in the life of Daisy and then it talks about um, the teaching methodology that I developed from that. Um, and I was inspired in part by um, Latour's actor network theory, where we're encouraged to think of the, the worker and her machines or anything else that can create agency in the factory um, as being equals for the purpose of research. So I, I feel this kind of helped me to move away from this top down um, histories as well. Thank you. I think we were all so inspired by the methodology you developed and the approach and know that this is such an incredible moment that faculty can bring into the classroom, students can bring into their own research, and that it has such a huge contribution to this field. So really excited to be able to publish this and to share this work. Um, Ev, I'm going to pass it on now to you. Thank you. Uh... So hi, I'm Ev, um, they, them pronouns. I am a black genderqueer person wearing a white sweater. Um, I have a Afro and you can't really see, I have earrings on, they kind of blend into the background. But um, yeah, it's, I don't know if I have any more descript features <laughs> um, to tell, but my research is, well, this article specifically, is, as the title says, a sort of history of uh, trans femininity, particularly as mediated through um, aesthetics, beauty, and fashion. Um, the approach that I take is 
um, and very sort of radical and distinct from what I find in most fashion studies research, which is this intentional like divestment from humanism or this idea that uh, we're all kind of striving to be quote unquote human, um, which is sort of a concept produced by uh, philosophy, uh, particularly white philosophy. And a lot of what I'm working with is this idea of abjection and desirability um, and how this really constructs the embodiment of uh, gender uh, differentiated individuals. Um, but a major part of it is also thinking about um, fatness as a component of constructing this abject embodiment. Um, so sort of thinking toward how femininity is constructed or deconstructed, normalized or denormalized. Um, and that's kind of the major underpinning of the paper. Um, and it really is kind of taking a grand swing at history. Um, it's not meant to be a comprehensive history, of course. Uh, it's sort of meant to be a constructed history, one where we can imagine a future in which uh, trans embodiment is sort of actualized, supported, and completely subverts our current gender system that is notably oppressive. Um, and yeah, I think that that's the best description I can give right now. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, so much of, I think, the challenge that your article brings and the disruption to sort of very narrow logics is so clear. And the way you do that is really engaging and compelling. And I think as we read this piece, we thought immediately that this is going to be such a required reading in so many fashion studies courses, um, both for the approach you've taken to writing, but also, of course, to the way in which the topic um, that immediately starts to challenge these narrow ideals and constructs that fashion has reinforced. So we're really thrilled with your contribution. Allison, I'll pass it over to you. Sure, um, thank you. And people have given a brief description of their um, contributions, but um, we would love to know, because we have this wonderful opportunity in the launch, we would love to know a little bit more about what personally inspired your own research um, for this contribution to volume four. Um, and maybe we can use, go in the same order as well as before. Thank you. All right, um, for me, um, the truth is I stumbled on the concept of user generated content. I've always been interested in um, cultural fashion from like a Nigerian point of view. And so I'd, I was, I think I was writing a paper on Ashoebi in Nigeria. And Ashoebi is a Yoruba word for family clothing. And it has to do with like, you know, the way it is over here, I'm wearing something called um, Adurate's tie and dye. So imagine 50 of us wearing this in celebration of like a birthday party or in celebration of a wedding. So we're very communal and when we're celebrating things over here, especially, you know, from a Yoruba point of view, but I would also say from a Nigerian point of view, because the culture has kind of like become a national thing. People tend to wear like the same color or the same fabric to celebrate things. So I started writing a paper on that just to see what was dry, what, why such a culture that seemed to be like historical driven is still relevant in modern times. And what has happened is um, with that type of fashion, people have started making modern styles out of it. So um, maybe hundred years, 50 years ago, it was mostly traditional styles, but now it has become a modern thing that people celebrate. And if you just search for Asher B right now on the in Google, you see the kind of different styles that come up for both male and female. And then that led me to, of course, the digital platform. And, and I, I think I, I have my hands in so many things. And so I, I've, I mean, in my professional work, I, I deal with digital marketing. So I think everything just kind of came together. And I was like, there's this platform where people actually just submit their pictures and that drives the content for this page. And I found out to be different because I mean like I said earlier when you look at the fashion sphere like the traditional fashion sphere there is a sort of rigid rigidity in terms of who is driving the content production but on this platform what happens is people submit their pictures or in their traditional attire and then the um 
publisher kind of selects it and decides who, which picture kind of goes forward. But people have people had comments, um, you know, saying, "Oh, I like this. I think you should publish this. I think you should take this down." And you know, there was a conversation between the producer, the the owners of the platform, and the people contributing in in, for, in pictures and information. So I just noticed that there was something there and. I mean, right now, the blog in itself is evolving to like Instagram, right? And, and now they have like an Instagram community just for, for that particular page. So it's it's a digital stroke fashion culture going. It's, it's like an intersection of our culture of digital platforms and um, the fashion media production process. And I, I really found it to be interesting. So yeah, that was that was what actually spiked my interest in this. Oh, my, my, well, I say interest. So that was what inspired this research, yes. So this actually, wonderful yeah. celebratory practice of wearing. Yes. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, and so move on to Suzanne. Um, what, what personally inspired your research into this topic? I think it, it's my background as um, I trained in fashion design and then I found myself mostly working as um, a costume maker in film and theater. So I think of myself as somebody who works with clothes, who makes them. And so whatever I, I've looked at, I'm always interested in how, it, how things are made. Um, my interest in the blouse comes directly from um, Professor Lee Taylor, who um, told me <laughs> about 13 years ago that blouses were an under-researched uh, object and that I should look at them. And Lou said she'd been thinking about them for a long time and she thought they were important. And so I thought, oh, well, what can I do with them? And then I combine my kind of making experience with the blouse. And that's how that kind of developed really into my research subject. Um, and I guess that I always felt that makers, the maker was a bit of an undervalued aspect in the relationship between design and maker um, in terms of. And, and also the consumer is looked at more than the maker. And it, it links really to the fashion industry today as well, to campaigns like Who Made My Clothes. We're still not understanding about the people who are the producers. And I, I sort of felt by looking at the industry in its early years, maybe we can kind of understand it in a different way. Wonderful. Um, I always... I think it's useful to think both about the, I mean, the user generated content is that we were just talking about, but also the makers themselves. And it sounds like you brought your own embodied perspective as a maker to this work um, to share it with people. And that's always a really interesting perspective. Um, and I'd love to go on to um, hear from Ev about your own personal inspiration for this research. Yeah, my, um, I would say my inspiration is rooted a lot in my sort of personal identity. Um, as someone who is Black and genderqueer, uh, I do think a lot about um, like gender, but also in a sense how to create gender and what it means to create gender. Um, and I think this was kind of a this is also sort of part of my uh, thesis and was part of a thesis project last year um, where I was really trying to understand not just how fashion produced a certain gender, but how fashion was really involved in a lot of these metaphysical and philosophical topics and ideas of embodiment and humanism and uh, essentially thinking, I think also through the lens of Blackness is a major component of how I'm really approaching this, I mean, general area of research, because for me, I think whenever I have read so much of gender theory or like queer theory, I mean, the biggest names are non, like are white. <laughs> um, and I think just being black and writing it is not uh, in essence, quote unquote, revolutionary. But for me, I really wanted to understand what it is to think from a, in essence, a blackened lens um, and thinking toward 
what it means to engage with gender as something that is uh, anti-Black, but also thinking of um, the opportunities and potential of gender to function in relationship to Blackness, if that's the word that we end up using and things like that. Um, so a lot of it was kind of just, yeah, like I mentioned a very personal um, component of trying to understand how my Blackness interacts with my gender and thinking towards like, my friends and how their Blackness interacts with their gender, or their race or whiteness interacts with gender, um, because these are such, I mean, interwoven ideas and embodiments that I think have only, we've only really started scratching the surface of what we can say about gender and sexuality and race. Um, and I think using fashion for me was a major um, thing just because that's really where I've honed a lot of my research in on is understanding aesthetics, the visual culture and fashion of a lot of the interrelations and intersections of these ideas and topics. Thank you. Yeah, it's so it does. I mean, the personal is political, right? <laughs> and <laughs> so um, I, I mean, we're really, really grateful to have this um, perspective that you're bringing to, as you say, a, a, a kind of a dis discourse that's been largely through a, a white lens to this, to your own blackened lens. Um, that's really beautiful. Thank you. Okay, and I'll pass it over to um, Ben, but thank you for your answers. I feel like your answers are just getting everyone on this Zoom right now really excited to read your articles, um, just as you're describing what inspired them, what they're about. Um, they're such brilliant contributions. We have one more question about uh, the contributions uh, for this volume. And then Alison and I have prepared some other questions about your style, about your writing practices, um, some rapid fire questions, some, you know, very quick. So we'll do one more questions about the contribution and then we'll go into some other ones. Um, you all, I mean, I think you started to really kind of mention this in your answer, um, but our next question was really, how do you think your contribution engages and challenges the discipline of fashion studies? Um, in what ways, right? We're always thinking about in this journal, how we can expand the field, how we can push it in new directions. And I think all of your contributions do that. And we'd love to know a little bit about how you started to think through that, how you think through this, your, the contribution you made expands, challenges, moves the field. Um, and maybe we'll change up the order and maybe Ev will go with you to get started. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I mentioned sort of how I was really trying to unpack and undermine the humanism bound up in fashion studies. Um, I think a lot of whenever I'd read fashion theory or fashion writing, I remember at a certain point I got mildly disheartened because it felt as if everyone was starting from a very specific space that I just could not always kind of feed into. And that was this idea that we're all kind of striving towards humanity or being like capital H human, um, which I think is of course bound up in like whiteness and like just cis hetero patriarchal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I really wanted this paper and pretty much all of my writing after to be uh, a meditation on, but also an intentional divestment from that assumption that there is this kind of core humanity that we're all sort of now we're all accepted into and now we're all striving toward because I mean for thousands of years that just wasn't the case for so many different marginalized groups and still to this day it's such a major component when thinking of still marginalized groups. Um, so I think that's really what I want my work to be is this 
I guess, roadmap for understanding how to divest and to undermine and to usurp this sort of regime of humanist philosophy that sort of serves as the ground for how so many of us write. Um, and yeah. I really love your phrasing about this roadmap to divest from that. And I think that's something that you can feel reading your paper. And I think that's something that readers can really take to really think about the assumptions that are made in the field that underpin so much work um, and what happens when we actually question and challenge not just those assumptions, but begin from a very different point. Suzanne, I'll pass it to you now. Thank you, Ben. Um, so my contribution engages with fashion studies by bringing in the stories on the factory floor of these women who were uh, working class, uh, making everyday blouses, but they are the pioneering professionals in the fashion industry. They're um, the women who are working as designers and cutters and and this is, I think, the first time that you start to see these sort of this work within the factory. And, you know, just from looking at classified ad advertisements, you can see like, how um, accomplished they had to be, how many different roles they took on. So I, I kind of wanted to bring their stories into fashion studies. Um, but I also really wanted to... Um, I don't know, bring forward my idea about storytelling. Like it, it offers fashion studies a kind of gentle and experimental way into their subject. Um, I felt that for me, it was really useful because academic writing can be stressful. And, you know, sometimes we get writer's block. And so after I had my first outline of Day's story, I found myself returning to it and updating it. And on these days when I couldn't get started with writing or I felt really low just by just working a little bit on days of story, I found it really helpful. It was just because I wrote it as if no, I assumed no one would ever read it. <laughs> so it's a surprise to my past self that it's published <laughs> today. Um, but it, so I think because I wrote it in that way, it was really Freeing, um, and I just really appreciated the effect that it had on me in a really positive way. And I guess my challenge to the subject is to embrace creative methods and just to experiment with things. And, you know, it can bring new avenues of thought and also it can make us happy. And that's something perhaps we forget to think about sometimes within our research process. Yeah, I think... The challenge, particularly within either the humanities or social science spheres of fashion studies, of bringing in that element of creativity in our writing, of fun, of joy, um, right, versus having to follow this sort of rigid and narrow way of writing, um, but to play with not just different modes, but with storytelling and creative writing, I think is a really exciting avenue and an exciting provocation for so many of us um, and how you model that. More lucky, I'll pass the question now over to you to tell us about the ways you think your contribution moves and challenges the field. Um, I'll say that from, I mean, and I think I discovered this while I was researching the paper is, or when I was writing writing my doctoral thesis. So my thesis was, um, was on city branding and fashion cities. And, you know, the case study was Lagos City, Nigeria, and how, like, the ecosystem kind of feeds into the perception of the city brand. And my search for that, I, I discovered that in terms of like fashion um, in Nigeria, the field is still, is still, is still developing. Like there's there's so much to be done. And especially in the in the area of fashion media. So um, if you look at the Nigerian sphere um, in terms of fashion media, we, we do have some sort of fashion centric publications, but I wouldn't say that we hit the ground running when it comes to like, oh, this is a fashion magazine or this is a fashion blog and it's like this is centered on fashion. So I think that my, my study kind of 
brings a how do I say it now a new a new it, it brings a new perspective to things to looking at it from like a user point of view a user generated of how, a user generated point of view and how media is produced in Nigeria not just from an editorial point of view but also from the user point of view and I think that what what I would say in terms of like recommendations and like you know, of course every every time you publish something or you do research you're looking at how we can be actionable I think that our space is kind of different from like the western um space in terms of like what people want to read and what they want to see and so this study kind of gives a view into that that while there's a local global fashion sphere there's also a need for localization to look inwards that if you're going to be doing fashion media for Nigeria, then you need to consider certain things like culture. You need to consider certain things about who is reading it, what they want to see, the type of trends, and the fact that they actually want to be involved in that process of dictating what they think fashion trends are. I know that that is all. I mean, I mean that can that can be generalized, but when it comes to Nigeria, there's a bit of like the culture thing, and I think that that's why Ashebi Bella has been so successful that it's become a social media phenomenon. So yeah, I think that my, my study contributes to Nigerian fashion media, especially since that area is still, um, there's still a lot to be developed, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think the recommendations obviously that you can, that your work proposes for practice um, really challenge the field that often doesn't take a contextual or localized approach. And your work really mm -hmm. highlights the need and necessity of doing that um, and the role of culture. Alison, I'll pass it to you. Now, as we move from kind of our contribute, our questions around your contribution to our questions more about you and your process. Yes, this is, it's lovely at our launch to just have a chance to get to know you better and for our readership also to kind of get to know our authors um, because it can, as you say, it can be a difficult process writing for a journal. Um, and you know it can we often get stuck and um, forget that joy and happiness that we're, we were speaking about and so it really is a joy um, to kind of to actually interact and um, not just have words be on the page or on the digital um, interface but also to have you here with us so we we also just um, wanted to ask you some perhaps more informal questions but we we wondered um, how you would describe your own style um, and how you would think of your own everyday clothing choices um, especially when you're dressing for the world of academia so talk a little bit about yeah your own style your own how do you get dressed every like what do you put on every day and when you're also dressing for this academic sphere but as a fashion studies um, scholar so let's start with uh, Mora Lake. <laughs> Okay, I will say that my style is like vintage with a dash of modern and a streak of like cultural, <laughs> I don't know, like a cultural streak is there. Um, because I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have my, I have my legs in both um, the professional sphere and academia. So by day, I'm, I'm a marketing communications professional. So you can see that it's, it's one of the things that kind of features in my work, the fact that I'm focusing on it like a digital platform, but um, so, but when it comes to academia in terms of like teaching, because I've also like lectured, it's mostly corporate um, because of the dress code um, in the university. But if you really ask me when it comes to writing at night, which is when I mostly write, I would say comfortable clothing that makes me, you know, I need to be comfortable while I'm seated for hours. So if you're really asking me the question on, on academia, I will say that comfortable comfortable clothing yes amazing yeah we can all relate to that I think <laughs> <laughs> the wonderful comfort that you need to write in um and what are your favorite like what's your favorite outfit that you have when you dress up and go out or to participate in um a social communal event that's me right yeah 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 still for oh, you oh yeah oh so for <laughs> me it would be I vintage shirts I, I have like a lot of vintage shirts so if I'm going out I don't know, comfort, com comfort comes first for me, comfort and some bit of like my personal style. Like I want to look, I, I have dreadlocks, so I already have some vibe going on there and piercings and all of that. So I like, um, I would be wearing my vintage shirts, mostly, most, most likely mom jeans, and they have to be shredded or not. 
but jeans, vintage shirts, and like a flat pair of shoes or sneakers. Yeah, that's it. Doesn't sound academic, but that's the kind of style that I almost like the girl with on a normal day. Yes. Oh, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Hope we get to meet you in person one day too. <laughs> so. so. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay, maybe over to um, Ev. Just you can you can talk to us about a bit about yeah your own style, um, your everyday clothing, um, and how you negotiate and navigate that world of academia as well. Yeah. Um, so it's actually interesting. I am really only in academia or academic spaces on Mondays right now. Um, because I work full-time Tuesday to Saturday in an art gallery. Um, and there, I mean, my style between the two doesn't really change, um, but I would say, interestingly, I am not too, <laughs> um, I don't really think about comfort that much. It really is kind of just, I buy a lot of my clothes secondhand, um, and a lot of what I have right now is like uh, cashmere that I got for $30 or alpaca sweaters that I got for 40 And it'll just be kind of very basic and simple outfits um, that are usually quite comfortable. But at times it's very just, I'm going for the look. <laughs> um, and then I will... Yeah, I don't, I think my, yeah, my style right now is quite basic. I've, my, my partner recently described my style as like a, a 40 year old in the Upper East Side, cause it's all just kind of very like, uh, not terribly like tight fitting. It's kind of loose and a bit decadent, um, which honestly I took a little offense to, but then I thought about it and I was like, yeah. Uh, so I would say that that's generally my style right now is very much going for a very specific aesthetic, um, which funnily enough, I pretty much set my aesthetic for the year in like January or February. And then I'm kind of writing that look until the next year. And then I'll make a new mood board for the whole year, um, which is pretty fun because uh, I get to come up with new outfits, have a whole new energy to myself for a year. Um, I think this year was, it was nice to have comfortable like clothing that was still quite refined and nice. That's beautiful. Okay, I now know what I'm doing in January. I'm um, so <laughs> record for the year. I love that. Um, and yeah, I love the cozy cashmere. It's perfect in this weather, I'm sure, too. So, um, but thank you for sharing that with us. And how about you, Suzanne? I feel like there are two me's. There's the one that the world will never see when I'm at home in track pants and an old sweater. And that's my kind of writing clothes. And you know, I, I can wear the same things for quite a long time if I'm on a roll with my writing. Um, and then just like my style, I, I feel like maybe I peaked in the 1970s when I was a child. So I, get, I go back to this era of the 70s, like at the moment, I'm like wearing some wide leg trousers and my um, snakeskin boots. <laughs> and I just, It's my favorite sort of period. So that's kind of where I'm comfortable. Um, and it, you know, working at the University of Brighton. Brighton's a very relaxed, experimental kind of place. So I feel I could wear anything really and it wouldn't matter so much. But I, I, I do have quite a lot of black clothes because um, I think when I'm in a hurry, you know, just any combination of whatever's hanging up will kind of go together. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm quite keen on um, footwear. So um, I like my trainers, um, my boots and things like that. And um, because it's a bit cold here at the moment, I've got a big uh, coat, a big coat made out of a recycled duvet. And so uh, I wear that a lot, but it's not great on public transport because when you sit down, it kind of expands and blows up. And then, you know, there's not so much room for people to sit next to me. <laughs> But yeah, 
I'm quite a comfortable, I like comfortable clothes, I guess, really. Those snakeskin boots sound fab though. <laughs> and I've definitely been seen, seeing a lot of like flared trousers on, uh, on social media, that's for sure. I just, I'm laughing because when I was in Brighton um, on a wonderful visiting fellowship in May, I just felt like it was just the fabulousness was so enjoyable. Like I, I had, my hair was blue at the time. And so I was, you know, someone with so another person with blue hair came up to me and just said, I love your blue hair. And I was like, I love your blue hair. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just, it's such a fun space to be in. Um, and yeah, just, uh, I imagine it's enjoyable to um, get dressed and go out in Brighton every day with the duvet. <laughs> yes. I guess I'll pass it on. Thank you for the for sharing um, sharing oh, your personal you. personal dress choices um, and how you navigate uh, spaces in your dress. And I'll pass it back to Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Now I think we want to talk a little bit about your own writing practices. I think obviously I'm sure for everyone at this launch, I know something Allison and I always talk about is in a busy world where you're maybe balancing like work and academia, or you have, you know, these multiple kind of competing activities or like demands on your time. How do you kind of create time or find time for your writing practice? And I think one of the things we're, we're really interested in is if you have any rituals that you might follow to like, develop your practice of writing or once you're in kind of to set the scene for your writing if you have any kind of rituals around your writing and uh Suzanne maybe we'll start with you thank you yeah it's quite hard to find time um to write in term time with sort of deadlines and things but um one thing that I found really effective this um summer was to work with colleagues at the university and we had a, an online writing group so we wrote for two hours in the morning um, on three different days a week. And we'd start off by just checking in and saying what we hope to write on. And then after about an hour, we'd have a very quick catch up and we'd sort of talk about any issues that were coming up for us and how it was going or how it wasn't. And then we'd you know, carry on for another hour and then we'd sort of feed back at the end. And it's not that we talked very much or we were helping each other out it was just sort of having other people there the proximity of other people who were working on um you know on their writing I just find that really helpful um and if I'm by myself at home I, I just have to write in short chunks really and take a break and have like reward in between um periods of writing so um chocolate features quite heavily in my writing practice and good coffee <laughs> yeah uh, I think I think the role of like community and creating community around writing as a ritual and practice can be super important especially because it can be such a isolating time where you're just in your own kind of space or in your own head, the ways to you know, build that community and relationships around it. Um, and also a sense of accountability of there's other people that are also writing with you. It kind of helps you to be in that space at that time and just to you know, sit down and try to get some writing done. Thank yeah, you. For absolutely. I should that. say, actually, we all committed to not having any of our you know, phones or anything on and that helped. Like very important, yeah. Thank you. Ev, what are your uh, kind of practices? How do you find time balancing kind of working and school um, to write? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I am. Um, so I'm a bit, usually whenever I'm writing, I really try to write for a long time. So I'll usually uh, try to write on like Sundays, which is my off day and just try to dedicate as much time to writing then. Um, I used to have these very intricate rituals uh, prior to writing and during writing. Um, but since I started my job, <laughs> uh, trying to find the space and time for the rituals has been definitely a journey, but I think I'm slowly building um, some rituals right now. Um, my favorite thing is to write to um, Julius Eastman. He's a 
black gay composer from the, uh, I want to say 80s, 70s, 80s. Um, and I think his uh, compositions are very, usually whenever the music crescendos in my head, I'm, I feel like I'm in maybe a movie and then I'm just kind of like going and writing. Um, so it's usually music is a very, very big component for me. Um, yeah, I, I remember I tried for a while to write like after work, but then I, that just was not <laughs> sustainable after a few days. Um, so I try to a lot time on Sundays or Mondays, um, preferably in the morning to just turn on music and just start writing or even just reading. Um, I think sometimes a big part of my writing process is just reading something. And then I get sort of that kickstart where I feel this sort of inspiration to start writing. Yeah, I love both of those suggestions. I mean, certainly I think music, particularly if there's certain um, composers and musicians or songs that kind of immediately bring you into that space of like, now is my writing time. Um, and like, yeah, the role of reading to kind of just almost like stretching before you go on a run or like doing something that that almost just gets you kind of warmed up to get going. I appreciate you sharing all of that. More Lake, what are some of your rituals? How do you find time um, between obviously working and writing? Um, so it depends on the time, especially like if I, I need to submit to paper, then it means that after work um, during the week, I actually try to do like one to two hours. It depends on how I'm feeling. Um, the ritual really starts from my mind, to be honest. I need to start riling myself up like on Monday when I'm when I go to work or like I'm, I work remotely most of the time it's like don't forget you're writing this night you have to so it starts with your target like I need to submit a paper by November 2022 so we're in June for you to get to this target you need to do like paragraph like you know write a certain number of paragraphs this week and so there's that target and I have to just keep reminding myself after uh, after you're done with work don't forget eight o'clock nine so it starts with my mind and then sometimes of course I get tired and I never like do write it so sometimes I just want to Netflix to be honest right but the ritual starts in my mind and then like as said music is um have said sorry is music is a big part of it for me um if it's usually one song depending on how how much I've been listening to it um, I listen to it just to wake me up because usually I take a nap between work and, and the academic um, writing time. And then when I wake up, because sometimes it's difficult to wake up from the nap, I listen to the music and, you know, try to get myself pumped up. I'm like, I can do this a bottle of water, you know, and I'm like, yeah, let's do this. Um, so, yeah, so week, week, weekdays at night and then Saturdays, I try not to write on Sundays. And another thing that I think really gets me in the mood is when I repeat a particular like inspirational word, like you need to, you can get this done tonight. I know you're tired, but you can get this done. So yeah, mind music and just sitting down and writing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. I think it's sometimes those moments where you maybe don't feel like doing it. And sometimes you're like, no, it's just not going to be tonight or I'm going to try. And then sometimes you just get into the flow. Um, and it's those rituals that can sometimes help us get there. Allison, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love this idea of ritual. It's been so challenging to to you know sit down and actually write in the last couple of years I find and I'm hoping to do that again myself in January with my book project that got put very much on hold um but yeah I I also wondered now that you I mean congratulations now your prod this contribution is out in the world and um I wonder if you'd mind sharing with us what your next project that you're thinking about working on um in whatever form that might take so if you um let's start with um Ev Yeah, um, so right now, aside from writing my thesis, um, that I think is maybe the biggest like next project that I'm working on. Um, as of this summer, I've been 
uh, strangely obsessed with the idea of ghosts and haunting, um, particularly as it relates to dressing practices and how this idea of the past sort of manifests like through our clothing and dressing practices. Um, so I'm working on an article uh, that will, I think it, I don't think it'll be out anytime soon, but um, I'm working on an article that is focused on um, transgender ghosts and how uh, sort of this construction of like the ghost uh, haunts like transgender like living um, and dressing uh, today. Um, so I'm sort of going back to my quote unquote roots. Uh, I majored in English in undergrad um, and I haven't really done literary analysis in quite a long time and I'm trying to go back and right now I'm in the middle of reading um, The Death of Vivek Oji um, and I'm also reading a text about like visitations, um, I forget the rest of the title but it's like black women's um, like conjuring and this idea of sort of inviting these sort of past spirits into today and this idea of creating the self in the future with these ghosts as a collaborative practice. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That's that's beautiful. I know things take time. Um, so we we will look forward to it when it does in its good time when it comes out. Um, we'll really enjoy. I can't wait to read that. Um, thank you. Um, and then how about um, let's do more Olake. See what you, what what is your next um, endeavor? <gasps> so I'm I'm an, I'm I'm, an, I'm on a writing break right now. Right. I but I will talk about the last paper that I just submitted. Um, so the last paper I submitted was is in a series for um, it's like a campus series, a university series. So a couple of writers writing about um, Nigerian universities, and I, I'm writing on campus fashion in Nigerian universities. Um, and so what the students wear, what drives the dress code, because. Um, in Nigeria, there are lots of dress codes depending on the type of university. So my, my paper kind of covers that, like what, what drives the dress codes in, on these campuses? How does it um, interact with gender? How does it interact with individual expression? How does it um, interact with the future world of work? How does it interact with the creative industries? Because over here, there's like a dependence on imported fashion. So um, if you look at it, people kind of develop their personal style in university. So it's important that whatever it is that they're wearing is kind of, how do I say now, kind of prepares them for the future of work. And, and so looking at my, my study kind of focuses on how the nation um, and the university administration has to kind of look at the kind of, the kind of clothing that they're proposing because there's a dependence on Western clothing for um, Nigerian universities. And we have so many cultural styles and cultural attires and we have a fashion industry that is booming. So I would rather that they look at the dress codes. I mean, this is my opinion here, of course. I would rather that they look at dress codes, not from a sexual harassment point of view or a gender point of view, but from a, we need to go our creative industries and how can we look at what is available in terms of local fabrics and put that in the dress codes instead of just, you need to dress corporate and cover a body part, etc, etc. So yeah, that's what my last work or last paper was about. Thank you, that's, and then that will be, will that be coming out soon or? 2020, I just submitted it yesterday, by the way. So Congratulations. <laughs> yes, <thank laughs> that's you. amazing. <laughs> okay, so 2023, it'll be out? When, yeah, 2023, yes, yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. So this is, uh, you know, definitely the hauntings of the transgen ghost, transgendered ghosts, but also of colonial pasts that are still living on in these dress codes, it sounds like yeah. on campus. Um, yeah, in a space where you are forming, you know, forming your future self. So what does that say? That's really going to be interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, Suzanne, what are, what are 
you and congrats on getting it in. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, Suzanne, what would tell us a little bit about your next project? Um, so I've been working on a book proposal to um, make my PhD thesis into a book, but I very much want to tell a global story of the British flowers industry. So I've been investigating um, textile stories within the book. I haven't quite decided how I might present it in each chapter, but for example, um, Japanese silk was really important to the British flowers industry, especially at the sort of lower end of the market or a kind of demarcated class. It was very cheap for um, some women and for others it was used kind of as linings if you were a kind of um, you know, more elite kind of, uh, consumer. So there's that, that sort of story that I want to tell, but um, by going I have a, an idea that I need to go to Japan to find this story and also to engage with scholars um, as well, me silk. And, and then there's another kind of thread of um, inspiration that comes through in my research from, um, uh, I don't know, blouses that from Eastern Europe are uh, design influences in the British blouse industry. So there's casual references to a Magyar sleeve, for example. So I want to follow those stories to make them central to this British blouse and to sort of decolonize my research um, as much as I can. That feels really important to me. So it's taken me a, a lot longer than I, I imagined it would, but yeah, it's it's kind of getting there. Thank you. Well, I hope that it goes well for the proposal. It's um, it is. I mean, even when you think about the global maps historically and today of how our even one garment like the blouse comes together um, from this global materiality and what that what the implications and what the meanings of that are. It's uh, it does it is um often uh, complicated, but also collaborative work to discover and uncover those things. So um, we look forward to hearing how that continues to go forward. Um, and thank you to all three of you for, for sharing your next projects. This is, I'm getting incredibly excited for all of them. So thank you. And I'll pass it back to Ben. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. This sounds really incredible what you're all working on. We now have some rapid speed questions. Um, so we can, maybe we can start in the first order that we began the panel today with. Um, and the first rapid question we have, if you were stuck on an island with someone from the fashion world, who would it be? And maybe I'm gonna add to that question, why? More lucky, we can begin with you. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I have to cheat here and say two people. Um, the first person, the female, will be Iris Apfel. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Why? Because she just kind of lets you know that age doesn't define anything. Um, and the fact that she got popular like in, 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 you know, in her later years. And the second person will be Fela Kuti. I mean, it's not a fashion, um, it's not in the fashion industry, but his music kind of influenced fashion as well. His style has kind of influenced fashion. Um, in terms of like the kind of fabric and the style and the the drawings on 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 his attire, so yeah, those those two guys. And why? Because um, there's such, some sort of active activism involved there in his fashion and his music. Yeah, for those two. I love that, uh, Suzanne. I'm glad more or less you went with two people because I find it really hard to to choose. Um, I guess. <laughs> Ideally, there'd be someone from my research, like a Daisy character, who I could speak to about what it was like on the factory floor back, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, but you know, the maker in me wants to meet, go back in time and meet Cristobal Balenciaga, so that he can tell me, you know, how he made and cut certain things, like his sleeves, and uh, you know, just to reveal his secrets to me. And Ev, what about you? Um, I think for me, I would pick Octavia Saint Laurent. Uh, she's a trans um, activist who 
passed away almost a decade ago. Um, and she, I, I don't know if she's like specifically in fashion, but I think just after watching so many interviews of hers, particularly for my upcoming project, um, she just would be a, a fiery and amazing person to, I mean, be stuck on an island with. Like, I, it, <laughs> I don't know if we'd survive very long, but we would have some amazing conversations, I'm sure. <laughs> which is really what matters, this conversation. It's okay, our next next question. Allison, do you wanna ask the next rapid question? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking how I would answer these questions myself and you know, maybe I should spend some time thinking about that after this, but um, we can go in it, we can start with Suzanne, but I, I guess we had a question about one thing, you know, we, we all kind of were trained to develop our perspectives and our, you know, our analysis and our critical skills, but, um, can you describe something that you might have changed your perspective on over the last few years, perhaps, or recently, like something that's made you change your perspective on your work? Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, going back to thinking about the way I trained, you know, many years ago, I guess I used to, the thing that I've changed my perspective on is the definition of fashion. Um, you know, when I first started to learn about fashion's history, it was about fashion as a sort of Western kind of construct about seasonality and about novelty. And I do not think that way anymore. Fashion is about style change and, you know, and, and I think with um, this thinking that it opens it out and it broadens it about what fashion was in the past, what it is now and what it can be in the future. And I think that's really exciting for our subject. So yeah, just the definition of fashion itself. The broadening and, and kind of challenging your own kind of training in that in that sphere yeah. of what fashion might might be and might might have been and might be in the future. Yeah, that's that's I think important for all of us to continue to do. Um, how about um more lucky? What would what would you say? What have you changed your perspective on? I think that it's the I mean before before I came into the fashions fashion studies space like I kind of dabbled into like fashion entrepreneurship and then I used to think oh styles and sketching and all of that and and then going into the studies itself I can see that like it's skin deep in terms of like there's an ecosystem there there's the political aspect of things there is like the emotional aspect of things. I mean, I've, I've, I've written a paper on fashion and motherhood and how it's represented in movies. And so I, I kind of understand that like there's, there's so much in there. It's also like a creative industry that can actually change the perception of a city like New York, London, Lagos, for example. So for me, I think it's, it's such a powerful concept concept that goes beyond dressing. But as, as Susan also mentioned, the fact that there are workers, you know, on the factory floor, there, there's that bit that nobody sees, but you just get like the final garment and you just put it on. And it's so much bigger than that. So yeah, I think that it's something that I, I will never get over that just keeps unraveling every day. Yeah. Uh, the unraveling of fashion studies, what a beautiful, Beautiful. Yeah. And, um, and I, I also it just reminds me of what you were saying about disinvestment as well, of, um, just how we need to disinvest in many things. Like, <laughs> the word is very important. So um, how would you say, what would have you changed your perspective on? Um, I think what I've maybe mentioned, uh, I think, yeah, this divestment from humanism is, has been a big shift for me because it's completely changed I think just how I approach not just fashion studies but how I approach thinking about visual culture and aesthetics and just like existence in general um oh, I had another something I wanted to say but I completely forgot but I think yeah this divestment from humanism and really investing in sort of like Foucault's like heterotopias and ideas of futurity for those disenfranchised and marginalized um, existences and embodiments. That's beautiful. And I'm sure it'll hopefully it'll come back and we still have a little bit of time 
Um, but thank you for all. I mean, I think, yeah, there are so many things that we still, we're still kind of that need to shift and that are in, in process of shifting. And um, and I think if anything coming from fashion studies, it's such a mutable and constantly shifting and perhaps, yeah, discipline um, and, you know, space that I, I, I yeah, <laughs> I look forward to seeing how it continues to change and shift um, and what we can take from, as a historian, what we can take from the past and what we can just um, divest ourselves of um, as we go forward or as we continue to engage in our work. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, I'll pass it back. Um, we spoke a little bit about this, but we're gonna come back to a space of, oh, well, I'll leave it to Ben, to a, to a an optimistic space. If yes, you. back to a space of happiness. Okay, our last kind of rapid question, and Ev, we'll start with you. What makes you happy? Um, oh, I think just, I don't know, to, I think, yeah, thinking about opportunity and the potential of things, which I know is very vague, but I, I remembered what I was going to say is that this kind of distinction, like we live a lot of our lives along these sort of binaries or categories. Um, and I think one I've been thinking about a lot is like life and death. Um, and I think the opportunity for thinking about life in the future, um, which I know I like with a lot of like climate doom, there's this maybe kind of sort of looming presence of like the precarity of the future. Um, but even in that precarity, finding those like little holes and those little slippages and areas for like life and beauty and enjoyment and something that is beyond exactly what we're living in right now. Um, and I think that's something that excites me and makes me happy to continue doing the work that I do the slippages. Marlake, what makes you happy? I think I've kind of mentioned something, the opportunities that are abound. Um, but on a less than serious note, I will say good food, a really good nap. <laughs> and then of course, like hearing good news and seeing others thrive. And yeah, those, those three things, good food and sleep, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. You can all relate to good food for sure. Um, Suzanne. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that, but more lucky about the opportunities that are around um, and, you know, the, just seeing opportunities that are available now to more people that they just didn't used to be there maybe 25 years ago. That makes me happy. But yeah, also I love being outdoors, just being in nature and, um, Chocolate, chocolate makes me happy, and a good glass of wine as well. Amazing, thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass it to Allison for our last question. And I just wanted to kind of remind everyone, we do have a three, we have three books that we're giving away. So uh, please stick around and we're gonna be doing that at the end of today. Allison, I'll pass it to you. Sure, yeah, we'll keep, uh, thank you. I'm very just happy with your, with happiness. And um, I wanted to also just, Really um, quickly, um, you know, it is difficult to have this hope in our current situation, but I guess, um, what is your hope for the future of fashion studies more generally? What were you, what would you say? Um, and maybe let's go in reverse order. So we'll start with Suzanne. Um. Thank you. Um, well, just that it keeps broadening and it keeps embracing everybody that wants to be part of fashion studies and then it keeps giving opportunities with many people who want to have them and that um, maybe those of us that have positions to help others can carry on and do that and um, that you know it's such a, it's exciting the way it's going and I really like that um, and, and also I kind of like I hope that the environmental impact of fashion will just kind of continue to be central to the dialogues that we have about the fashion industry, about the past, the present and the future, because 
um, that, that's important too. Well, thank you. And Maura Lucky, what, what's your future for the fa for fashion? Or what's your, sorry, <laughs> what's your hope oh, no. the future? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I hope to, to hear more African stories and African voices from like a fashion perspective. I think that um, there's so many like cultural aspects of things that have not been captured in literature that that <laughs> that needs to be captured. Right. Um, yeah, I hope to see more of that. And of course, similar to what Suzanne uh, mentioned as well, the environmental impact of things, fashion sustainability. <laughs> And of course, fashion tech as well, because I'm in the tech space. So I really, I'm, I'm hopeful to see how tech can transform things the way um, the mobile phone is now like available to everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see how tech can transform fashion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chanel. What, what's your hope? Yeah, I, uh, hmm. I remember I tried to think about this um, before, but um, I didn't, I don't know if I ever settled on something very concrete. Um, I think one big thing that I would really like to see is this sort of rapid or massive expansion in methodology and source material and perspective. Um, not just sort of being quote, like more inclusive, but being like more abrasive and really trying to get um, to the core of what, I mean, I, I think back to um, whenever I started thinking about this project almost two years ago, this idea of how do I define it? every single word that I'm using. Like, how do I actually start writing about this? How am I gonna write in fashion studies? I have to think about what fashion is, what we're building upon. And I just kind of, that's something that I really, I don't know, I think about the future of fashion studies as something that is more reflective, more introspective, more abrasive, more radical, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. That's, that in and of itself is such a reflective and um, poetic kind of way of thinking of not just kind of just inclusion, um, but also our radical politics or our radical um, challenges and ab abrasion, I like not just inclusion, but abrasion. I think that's a really, uh, words to live by there and things to think about um, in the future of our fields. So thank you for that. Um, and um, with that, I'll pass it back to Ben for a minute and I think, or, and Deanna perhaps. <laughs> um, but thank you to everyone for all of your wonderful um, contributions to the volume and to this panel. And um, I've had lots of uh, it kind of direct messages from the audience saying how much they're uh, getting out of this uh, thoughtful discussion. So thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for such thoughtful responses. Um, we wanted to have a little bit of time for audience questions, although I realize we have 10 minutes left because we had such we had a lot of questions prepared. But I do want to take a moment if there's any questions um, in the chat. So please feel free to, to add them or to raise your hand if you have a question. Hi, everyone. I'm Deanna. I'm the uh, editorial assistant with the journal. Um, we have a question from Suzanne, who asks, what are the panelists opinions on the role of politics in North American fashion? So I don't know if anyone wants to take this question or start. The role of politics in fashion. And specifically North American fashion, but I recognize that we have a very international panel, so I think we can probably expand that to how you want to define it and if you want to incorporate, think about it in your own context and your own location.
definitely a big question. Okay, I think you can start first. I mean, I'm not familiar with North American fashion. I'm looking at what's happening currently in Nigeria. Um, in terms of like politics, right? There is a sort of um, politics in Nigeria is kind of it's kind of interesting. Um, I will say that the election, the elections currently, because we're, we're in election period in Nigeria, so I look at it from a voting and election um, point of view. I will say that it's there is a in Nigeria there's a there's a connection between um, pa political parties and fashion dress in quotes. So if if you remember, I mentioned Ashwebi, right? Um, it's so funny how such a cultural um, phenomenon like wearing family clothing has become something that shows symbolism for which party am I going to be supporting this election. So the whole influence of this is the person I'm supporting. So I get a face cap that has his name on it. This is the person I'm supporting. So I'm wearing like printed dressed, a printed Ankara, like Ankara is like print fabric that has his name on it. So I that's the way I will look at it, like off the top of my head, that there is there's such a connection between like I I stand for this and I stand for this with what I'm wearing or or my dress signifies what I stand for. So there's this symbol. I would look at it from a symbolism symbolism point of view from from my own perspective, but I'm not familiar with North American fashion. So sorry, I couldn't help you there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I also feel like I am not familiar enough with North American fashion. Um, and I guess um, in the UK, politics makes me really angry. <laughs> so <laughs> I try not to kind of think about it too much in terms of um, my own subject. Um, and I guess I probably don't feel that there's constraints on what people wear. I mean, maybe there was about sort of 10 years ago, we had the different prime minister. I remember when I was kind of researching for my blouses, um, the prime minister at the time, David Cameron, referred to the leader as, of the opposition as a big girl's blouse um, as an insult to him. So, you know things like that really but yeah I, I don't think the UK this isn't a great place to talk about politics I know we do have another question um but Eva, you don't need to respond but if you have a response um I mean I I can provide like a brief I I think at least whenever I think of fashion I I'm on a personal level incapable of disassociating it from politics and not, not just the sort of electoral politics of like the United States of America, but kind of these more communal, regional politics and how that sort of influences, uh, I mean, every component of our like lives and ways of being. Um, yeah, I think uh, one big thing, I remember I wrote like a short essay on uh, like using Christopher Brewer's fashionist communication to sort of analyze like the MAGA hat. Um, and I think there's, I mean, clothing and art, like articles of clothing have such, I mean, emotional and intense like ideas and meanings behind them even in sort of their like ubiquity. Um, yeah, I, I think the role of politics is definitely somehow a bit understated, even though I think there's this kind of massive recognition that it is always there as well. But I feel like we have yet to even, like I mentioned earlier, like scratch the surface of knowing yeah. yeah, there's so many places we could go. I feel that's an entire series of special issues for fashion studies to address. Uh, thank you for that question. Deanna, we'll pass it back to you. Hi, everyone. I think we have a few more in the chat. Oh, I need to see this roll. 
I think we have okay. time for probably one more question and then we'll do the book giveaway. Cool. Um, so I think how sustainable is your is the fashion industry, I guess, from like each part of the world that you're from is I think the follow-up question. <laughs> I wonder if that's a question from the same person. I wonder if there's a question from another, from oh, someone yeah. else. So we can is ask you. No, there's one in the chat. Oh, is that? Okay. Oh, let's see. The one for me. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, do, you, do you want to read it, Mia? Oh, okay. Um, as someone who is trying to decolonize history of art and fashion through intersectional feminism, what do you uh feel students need to know and what should we be putting emphasis on is from Mia no sorry I'm not oh. like I sent it in the chat oh from somebody else from someone else someone in the audience <laughs> does anyone want to jump in even if you think of kind of maybe one thing or in terms of you know, in terms of how what do you, is it, we have a lot of students in our audience and so what would what could what do students need to know about sort of decolonizing the history of art and fashion um, and what do you think they should be putting emphasis on? I, I think intersectionality is key. That um, you know it's it's really um, difficult to talk about decolonization without thinking about intersectionality. So. Um, that's what I would kind of emphasize to start with. Um, I don't know if the other two have got anything to add. I I think on top of that, like um, really knowing the like what you're saying and what words you're using and where you're coming from, I think is a really big, and not just like a, a like positionality perspective, but like what is the foundation that you're working from and really questioning i think if you're trying to decolonize you really have to understand what you're decolonizing otherwise so i sometimes you may replicate sort of other forms of coloniality in a sense Thank you. No, no comment from me. No comment from me. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. And as a day, thank you for that question. Um, I think now we have time for our book giveaway. Dan, I'll throw it back to you for that. Awesome. I'll put the names in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> can you show us the books as well maybe someone can put them in front of the our in-person um so nicole one of the people is nicole hanley um that's my friend <laughs> adelina afanas has won a book and ellen sampson who's one of our former Authors. <laughs> oh, so there, okay, can you tell us tell us what it is? Oh, show it, show yeah, it to us. for sure. So it's called Emotion, Fashion, and Transition. And oh gosh, I'm trying to remember who's one of the. It's an exhibition catalog oh, for the exhibition uh, by Kat Darrow, Alistair O'Neill, and Carolyn Evans. Thank you, Jacqueline. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's amazing. Um, okay, well, wow. Well, thank you everyone so, so, so much. I wanna just begin by thanking everyone who contributed to volume four. We have such an incredible series of articles, of course, to our three panelists. Um, I wanna thank our peer reviewers, our editorial board members. There's so many people who are involved in the process of reviewing submissions, offering feedback, working with you on revisions, and then getting everything up and on our website and published. Of course, our incredible, incredible team, um, Jacqueline, Mia, Diana, thank you so much for everything you do for fashion studies. Um, you're an incredible foundation to our journal. 
We have such incredible financial and in-kind support, of course, now from Shirk, from the Aid to Scholarly Journals Fund, from the Creative School and the Center for Fashion and Systemic Change at Toronto Metropolitan University, and of course, to the Catalyst for hosting today. We want to thank all of you, of course, our readers, our audience, for engaging with the journal, for suggesting ideas. Um, obviously, we're here to really provide a platform for this field, a platform that is free uh, for authors and obviously free for readers, and that really sees scholarship and creative practice as a form of community. And that's really the goal of this platform. And we're so grateful for all of you for engaging and being part of it. So thank you for attending the launch of volume four. We hope you enjoy this volume and please like continue to visit fashionstudies.ca for updates, for new articles that we'll publish over the course of the year and for- Coming special issues as well, which will be coming out in the next while, but um, it's already live. So if you haven't looked at it already, have a, have a look at our at fashionstudies.ca for volume four. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone who has been here today with us. Thanks so much, everyone. Happy thank reading. Thank you. Thank Happy you. reading. <laughs>